Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming this morning. I am I'm one of the entrants here at Cornerstone. I'm, my name is John Keller. Um, we're taking a break currently through our Sunday School series. We have two going on. Uh, Michael Spain's t- normally teaching on how do we study the Bible fruitfully and effectively. And Aaron is also teaching on uh, theology from a historical perspective. So he's going through centuries of church history, showing how doctrine has developed. Um, but since we're taking a break, I thought it would be appropriate time to try to mix those two ideas of seeing how the church has kind of formulated its thought, particularly in what Jesus says, and also see how we can do effective Bible study. And so if you have your Bibles with me, with you this morning, turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, starting with verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Will you pray with me? Father, Help us understand your word. Help us understand how your word speaks of your son, not just in the prophets, not just in the Psalms, but in Moses and the law of Moses. Help us to understand how that law not only teaches us obedience in our sin, but points us to Christ. Lord, help us to not set our hope in our own righteousness and our own obedience and our own success but to set our hope in your Son, Father. Teach us this hope. Grow our hope. Help us understand your word today, Father. Praise us in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we believe the writings of Moses? What did Moses write in the law that he, Jesus could ask, if you don't believe what he wrote, how you believe my words? That is a question I plan on answering today. Basically trying to unwrap what, what did Moses write about that was so important, that was so big, that Jesus can say, Moses will accuse you for not believing me and believing my words. We could do this approach in several different ways. We could look at types and shadows pointing to Christ, like the sacrificial system and the priesthood. We could also see if there's any direct or indirect prophecies about Jesus. But when we look at the law as a whole, from Genesis 1 to Deuteronomy 34, I think we can see an overall theme that points to Christ. There's not just points that lead to Christ. The whole frame of the book is directing the reader's gaze towards Christ, if we read it properly. And that's why I think Jesus is making this statement that the whole writings of Moses or the law point to him. In fact, all of Scripture points to Christ. If we go back a few verses in John 5 at verse 39, Jesus says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. All of Scripture points to Christ. And in Christ we have eternal life. But what is it about the law of Moses that points to Christ? Now before we get to that, I want to justify why I'm viewing the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, as one singular book. I think it's that because this is how Scripture refers to it. Turn to Joshua 1, starting in verse 7. Joshua 1, verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law you shall not depart from your, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make 
for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Again, when the Lord is speaking to Joshua to encourage him, to edify him, to meditate on what Moses wrote, he refers to it as a singular book, the one scroll, this book of the law. Now in Hebrew, the word for law is Torah. And Torah does mean law or legal code, but it can also mean teaching or instruction. And this nuance, I think, is sometimes lost when we say the word, English word for law is, is almost like the, what you do to obey, what you, the authority figures give over you, which is what the Torah is, but it's more than that. And I think we see this nuance even in the New Testament when we look at Paul in Romans 3, verse 24. We can see Paul take a nuance with this when he says in Romans 3, 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He uses the same Greek word, namas, to refer to law as something that God's righteousness has been manifested apart from, and then as something else. Now, in the ESV, it's interesting they capitalize one use of it, but not the other use of it. But in Greek, it's the same word, the same capitalization. And I think the reason he does that is because he's referring to the legal code of the law on Mount Sinai, which is right in the middle of the book. And then he's referring to the law and the prophets, or the whole book, with this one word. And so with that in mind, I would just like for us to just put on pause when we think of Genesis through Deuteronomy as a legal code or set of rules that we need to obey. And just try to think It does contain a law or a set of rules, but what else is in there? Is that the main structure of the book? It is in the center of the book, but what about before? What about after? What is the main thrust? In other words, what's the theological message that Moses is sending to his readers if they were to read Genesis 1 to Deuteronomy 34? The best way I think we can see that Moses is pointing people to Christ, or what Jesus is saying, is in its hinge points. So, the genre of the book is narrative. So, Genesis, we have the story of Adam and Eve. We also have the story of Abraham. We have the story of Joseph. We have the story of Moses. We have the story of Israel receiving the law. We have the story of Israel wandering in the wilderness, and many other stories. It's narrative. But interestingly, we have major poetic sections in the book. So in Genesis 49, we have Jacob calling his 12 sons and blesses them. This is the first major poetic section. Then we have in Exodus 15, Moses calling Israel and singing a song to the Lord, praising God for conquering the armies of Egypt and Pharaoh, crushing them beneath the waves of the Red Sea. So this second section is in Exodus 15. Then we have Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. But in Numbers 23 through 24, we have another poetic section where Balaam is hired by the king of Moab to curse Israel. But in fact, he is forced to bless Israel instead, and he gives four blessings. So we have a blessing, a song, blessing, and then at the very end of the book, we have another poetic section in Deuteronomy 32 through 33 where Moses teaches a song to Israel that will testify against them when they sin, and then he blesses the 12 tribes of Israel, mirroring what Jacob does. So we have narrative, poetic section, narrative, poetic section, and then again and again. If Moses is going to send us a message, if he's going to say, this is a really important point in my book, 
It would need to be in these four sections because if I'm reading story after story that is kind of connected but grows and progresses, but I get to this poetic section and I see similar themes, then maybe the author is trying to tell me something. And I think if we find that if we study these sections, if we look at these sections individually and then together, we will see a clear theme. In fact, I think we'll see Jesus when we do this study. So in the time that I have remaining, I just want to go through each of these sections one by one and point out some key observations. So let's begin with Genesis 49, starting with verse 1. So in Genesis 49, we have Jacob reunited with his son, Joseph, and they return. They go to Egypt, and Jacob, as his fathers before him did, blesses his sons. In verse 1, Moses writes, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall happen in the days to come. Now, this phrase is two words in Hebrew. I create your meme. It's translated differently by the ESV. It's not really clear why. In this, it's translated days to come. In other passages, it'll be translated in the latter days. Literally, what it means is last days. So as Genesis 1 began with in the beginning, here we have the phrase in the end days. So I'll get back to this later, but just note that this phrase is going to be repeated later on. So let's jump down to the, prop, the blessing to Judah, which is going to be in verse 8. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet, until a tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. So what stands out here? Any imagery that pops out? Well, first, in the very beginning, we have this phrase in, in between Judah's brothers praising him and bowing down before him, this interesting phrase of Judah's hand on the neck of his enemies. So not only does that verse stand out because of its imagery, it's right in between clear parallel. Why did Jacob or, and Moses insert that in between these two um, phrases? So we have hand over enemies. And then we also see in verses 8 and 10 that Judah is praised and respected by his brothers almost in a kingly way and that he will rule over the peoples in verse 10. Now, so to him, he was, thou shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now, at this point, Israel is not even really a people yet. They're still just a family, a clan. But eventually they develop into a nation or a people. Why does Moses and Jacob say that obedience of the peoples? Is he saying that the, each of the 12 tribes are going to be their own nation? Or is he saying that the king from Judah is going to rule over other nations? It's not really clear at this point, but let's just write down as an observation note. Obedience of nations. And finally, we have two sets of animal imagery used. First, Jacob compares Judah to a lion or a lioness crouching down to hunt prey. And then we also have imagery of a donkey and the son of a, of a colt and a son of a donkey. So lion, lioness, and then donkey, son of foal. So, 
With this in mind, let's go to Exodus 15, starting in verse 1. So in Exodus 15, verse 1, Moses gathers the people of Israel together to sing a song, praising God for the miracle of not only giving them deliverance, but also the miracle of crushing Israel's enemies. So in verse 1, Exodus 15, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed over gloriously the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea the Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation this is my God and I will praise him my father's God and I will exalt him the Lord is a man of war the Lord is his name Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea the floods covered them they went into the depths like a stone Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries and you send them out your fury and it consumes them like stubble. Let's pause there. So again, we have the the Lord's hand. So before we had Judah's hand or the king of Judah's hand over his enemies, here we have the Lord's hand against enemies. So you have the Lord's hand against the enemies. Let's pick back up in verse 12. Again, the hand imagery. You stretched out your hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, o Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. So just as the Lord's hand imagery is repeated, we have a new clarification of who are the enemies. So the enemies are listed as Moab, Edom, and Canaan, and also Philistia. Additionally, we also see that The song ends by proclaiming that the Lord, it's God who reigns forever. So the Lord is reigning forever. So the Lord reigns. And then we also can see that there's a planting imagery mentioned that the Lord is going to plant Israel. So he's going to plant Israel. And finally, we will note that the days to come is not mentioned here. The last days are not mentioned in this passage. This passage is focusing on what the Lord has just done and the characteristic of who God is. The God who conquers his enemies by his hand, who defeats not only his enemies, but Israel's enemies. And also, he's reigning forever and is going to plant Israel. The third poem section, Numbers 23 through 24, are where things get interesting. This is where the threads start to align together. Now, Balaam gives four prophecies, but we're going to look at the last two. So we're going to start in Numbers 24 and verse 1. Numbers 24, 1. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times, to look for omens. But he set his face to the wilderness, and Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, 
the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion and a lioness. Who will rouse him? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who cursed you. Let's write down some of these observations. So first, we have a king mentioned. So a king greater than Agag, one of the main kings in the region at the time. So king from Israel. This king will be exalted. He will come from Egypt. The Lord will be for him as the horns on an ox, meaning that the Lord will be his defense mechanism. It will be his weapon. When the king needs to defend his people, he's going to use the Lord. The Lord is going to be the one fighting his battles, in other words. So the Lord is his strength. And then we also see a repeated line from the lion and lioness here. So the king is referred to as a lion or lioness crouching down waiting for the hunt. This is no mistake. So lion and lioness imagery is repeated, meaning that the, kings, the king prophesied here is the same king that Balaam is talking about. Let's go on to the next um, prophecy from Balaam, starting in verse 14. Numbers 24, 14. And now behold, I'm going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Again, this is the same phrase, the days to come. In Hebrew, it's the exact same phrase. This is what's going to happen in the latter days. And he took up his discourse and said, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the head of Mo forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth, Edom shall be dispossessed, and Sir also, his enemy, shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly, and one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of the city. So here we see the phrase, days to come, or the latter days. So latter days, again, it's the same phrase. But here they translate it latter days because Balaam literally says, I see him who's not near but far. I'm not quite sure why the translators did this for this phrase. Because when he's talking about the days to come, same imagery is used of the lion crouching down. This is what the king's going to be like. He's going to rule with the scepter. Same imagery of scepter is also used here. But we also have some other observations. So we have the imagery of scepter repeated. We also note that the king will conquer the same enemies that the Lord will defeat. So this imagery is also carried over. So Moab is mentioned and Edom. And if we were to go further down in his prophecy and blessing for Israel, he lists many Canaanite cities. So the Canaanites will be destroyed by this king.
And then interestingly, in verse 19, he says that one from Jacob will exercise dominion over his enemies and will destroy his enemies. So again, we see the enemy theme repeated here. But instead of just saying he will defeat his enemies, he will exercise dominion over these enemies. So the king, so the king will rule over the nations, over his enemies. Same thing here. The obedience of the nations are as promised to the king in Genesis 49 and in Numbers 24, 19. And again, same phrase, days to come, latter days. This is what the king, the coming king is going to look like. What about Deuteronomy 32-33? This is a little bit harder to see, but even still I think we can see some of these same themes here. This is one of the sadder sections in the Pentateuch or the Torah. This is a sad section because... Moses is basically telling Israel, you're going to fail keeping this law I'm giving you. You're going to rebel against God. And so what I'm going to do right now is teach you a catchy song that you'll repeat for the generations. And as you sin, this song will will come back to your mind and will testify against you, knowing that the Lord was faithful and you remained unfaithful. And so this song basically just summarizes what the Lord has done and His faithfulness and then tells of Israel's unfaithfulness. But even in this song, we can see points of similarity. But let's go to Deuteronomy 31, 29 first. In Deuteronomy 31, 29, Moses says, For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come, there's that same phrase, Evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. So latter days is repeated here. Let's jump to the the end of the song in verse 40 of 32. In verse 40, Moses writes, writing of the Lord, For I will lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long haired head of the enemy. Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods. For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So the end of the song, which is mostly a rebuke against Israel, mentions that the Lord's hand will be against his enemies. The Lord will defeat his enemies, his adversaries. And he does so to avenge his people. So he will avenge his people. So the same theme as Exodus 15, the Lord will conquer his enemies and save his people. Even though the Lord will judge his people for their rebellion, the song ends with that reality. Well, if that's the song, what about Moses' blessing to the 12 tribes? Let's go to chapter 33, verse 1. Chapter 33, 1. This is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. So they followed in your steps. 
receiving direction from you when Moses commanded us a law as a possession for the assembly of Jacob. Thus the Lord became king in Jerashun. When the heads of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. And then he gives prophecies for the kingdom. So for Reuben, he says, Let Reuben live and not die, but let his men be few. And this he said of Judah. And here let's pay attention. There's not much here, but again, it's very important. Hear, O Israel, the voice of Judah and bring him into his people. With your hands contend for him and be a help against his adversaries. Now, compared to what we see with Jacob, compared to what we see in Numbers, there's not much here. But even with what is here, we can see some clear themes. So, we can see the Lord's hand, again, is referenced. But it's not the Lord's enemies it's referenced, it's the Judah's enemies referenced. So the Lord's hand is over Judah's enemies. And then we see Judah appeal to hear Judah, the voice of Judah. In other words, Judah is calling on the Lord for help. He's saying, Lord, defeat my enemies with your hand. And Moses is saying, Lord, hear Judah's call and defeat his enemies. But this was already prophesied. This was already a blessing for Judah. He's going to have his hand over the enemies. What I think Moses is clarifying here is that the way Judah has his hand on the neck of his enemies is because he has the Lord. The Lord is the, his horns as if he were an ox. The Lord is the way Judah conquers his enemies. It's not because Judah itself is strong, but because he has the Lord on his side. But if these two passages are connected, this prophecy is more connected to the king coming from Judah. Same imagery here. And I think the same is true for here in this passage. When it says the Lord became king in Jerushun, that word in Hebrew is for the one who is upright. And Moses in his song uses it almost sarcastically to describe Israel as one who's upright when they're not. And so when he's saying the Lord became king, he was repeating this refrain that the Lord reigns. But he's also reminding Israel that there is a coming king. There is one who is to come who is far, not near, who will have the scepter and will not pass it and will rule over the enemies. This king will call to the Lord for assistance. <clears throat> and the Lord will hear his call and conquer his enemies. And at the end of the day, he will have the obedience of the nations. This king will conquer the nations and will rule over the nations. Does this sound familiar? I think it does. I think that because this re image, this repeated imagery for the Lord hand, is particularly not just the Lord conquering the Lord's enemies, but conquering the same enemies listed for Israel and the same enemies listed here for Israel and the Lord, I think it's clear that there's a clear parallel between the king coming from Judah, ruling over Israel, the Lord conquering the enemies, the Lord conquering Israel's enemies, the king also conquering his enemies. How is the king and the Lord conquering the enemies? The Lord hears Judah's cry. And that is how it is accomplished. And again, this is going to happen in the latter days. Where do we see this in the Old Testament? I think we have time for three passages to look at in the Old Testament. Um, we'll start with Zechariah 9, verse 9. If you remember, I noted there's two 
imagery with animals. One is the lion and the lioness, which is repeated. The donkey imagery is not repeated in the law. In fact, it's not repeated anywhere else in Scripture except one other time where we see uh, a foal, the son of a donkey, or a donkey, son of a foal. Those three words aren't, don't really appear together except in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Zechariah writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, and here, look closely, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's the same phrase mentioned here, on a colt, son of a donkey. And what does he say? I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. So we have this king coming with righteousness and salvation. He's a king of peace. And what does the Lord do for this king? The Lord Tax his enemies. He will cut off the chariot. He will stop the war horse. Again, the same imagery that is picked up here is said that this king, who's coming with righteousness and salvation, is going to rule over the nations, and the Lord will defend for him. In fact, John quotes this same passage in John 12, 14 through 15, where John writes, And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy, and I think he is getting at that I am fulfilling the same prophecy that Moses told you about, of a king who will come, who will have his hand over his enemies, who will have the obedience of the nations, who is like a lion, but is also on a donkey. And the reason we can have both images is that he's like a lion conquering his enemies and on a donkey coming in peace is because the Lord is the one who's his strength. Let's go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, starting in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he speaks to them in his wrath and terrifies them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So we see again the connection between the son, the appointed king by the Lord, ruling over the nations and conquering those same nations. The same thing that we saw here where Judah... The king from Judah is going to defeat his enemies and have the obedience of the peoples. He's going to exercise dominion and destroy these cities. And again, it's the Lord who appoints the king. The Lord is the one who's in control. And again, the son has to ask. He is asking the Lord to give him these nations. Again, this verse makes more sense now why if the writer of Psalms is thinking of the, what's the voice of Judah saying. Well, maybe the voice of Judah is saying, Lord, give me these nations. Help me against my adversaries. I think that's what we can see here is that the son is asking the Lord for assistance against his enemies. Give me the nations as my inheritance, as you promised me. And he does. And finally, let's look at Hosea chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3, starting in verse 4. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, 
the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Yes, that is the same phrase repeated here, repeated here, and repeated here. In the latter days, the people of Israel, though they were exiled, though they rebelled against God, they will return to God. And who else? David, their king. Now, in Hosea's day, David was long dead. Who is he referring to? Who else but the other king in the latter days? The king who will come and have obedience of the nations. The king who will come riding on a donkey and have peace over the nations. Who will rule over the nations. This will happen in the latter days. So what what do we get here when we try to put this together as one synthesis? How do we apply this, in other words? This is who we set our hope on. Jesus did not come out of the blue saying, here I am. He was foretold. When we read the law properly, our hope should not be fixated on the Ten Commandments. That's not where our hope is. Our hope is in Christ. He was foretold time and time again. Our hope is in a king who is foretold in a book about how we obey our God. Our king was not something that the prophets saw only, but the prophets saw not just looking to the Lord, but looking in the law. I think many of these imagery we have quoted by Zechariah and then Psalm 2, I think it ties back to what we see here. I think these writers were reflecting and meditating on the law day and night, and the Lord inspired them, saying, this is who my king will be, and it progressed time and time again to ultimately John can say, Behold, the Lamb of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is why I think Jesus can say to the Pharisees and to the crowds, I'm not going to accuse you because you set your hope on Moses. But you didn't set your hope on what Moses pointed you towards. You set your hope on the law, thinking If I obey correctly, I can be justified before God. But instead, Moses is not pointing you to that. Moses is pointing to something greater than the law. And it's something that I think Paul picks up on when he picks up faith. When he picks up the faith of Abraham. And as we see in these Old Testament passages, they're picking up on this future king who is going to come. And so, ultimately, I just exhort you to put your hope in Christ. This hope is not something new. This is not something that Jesus made up or the apostles made up. This is something that is at the very core of the Old Testament, the law. If it's in the law, it's going to be everywhere else, and it is. And so with the time remaining, I'm going to open up for questions as best as I'm going to answer them as best as I can. Um, I hope I did my best explaining everything clearly. Um, But if you have any questions about anything, you're free to ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we reconcile those in light of Christ? Do we say that mm-hmm. God answered those prophecies through the old kings, like David and following, mm-hmm. or at Christ's second coming? Or just how do you reconcile that? Because yeah. Christ didn't destroy those nations. Himself. Right, right. I think Revelation helps with that, because the book of Revelation describes many of these enemies of Israel almost coming back, with Gog and Magog coming back. And Jesus returns and defeats his, the enemies in Revelation. So I think we see the king from Judah with David and many other kings partially fulfilling this, but not fully, because the enemies of Israel are never fully defeated. Even when Jesus comes, people are wanting him to overthrow the Romans because they're the enemies of Israel at the time. And Jesus doesn't because his work is is already but not yet. His work is not fully and final yet because he's giving time for the nations to repent. He's giving time for the gospel to be spread. So the way we can reconcile how is it that 
Jesus is supposed to be this king who's conquering his enemies, who's asking the nations to be his inheritance, who the Lord is going to conquer when it hasn't happened yet. I think it's because there is a second coming. If there weren't a second coming, it would be very difficult. I don't think this would make sense. I don't think Jesus would seem to be the Messiah if he didn't say he was going to come again. But because he's coming again, this makes sense. Any other questions? Just a thought. I, I grew up very legalistic. Mm-hmm. This is, to me, very exciting because in the middle of here's the rules to keep you in check with your behavior, mm-hmm. he pops in these little relational ideas. Like there's going to be coming in a relationship. You're going to be coming someone that you'll interact with and will interact with you. Uh, constantly saying, I'm behave yourselves, but, because that's all you can do right now, but there will be a time when uh, it will be family, it will be clannish, right. and uh, that's, that's encouraging. Yeah, just to repeat for the recording, uh, Nathan was noting that in the middle of the law, we have a person, a relational person, a human being referred to as, you can put your hope in him. This is something that's familial, that's relational. It's something that, when, if you're tempted toward legalism, this framework can break you of that because your hope isn't into an in-person standard, but an actual human being who came, who's, who came in the flesh. God in the flesh is the incarnation. Who's the God-man who will come again in the latter days and conquer his enemies fully and finally. days, 40 nights, it actually almost seems like that, like three times in a row, it's almost like 120 days of mm-hmm. this intense relationship time with Yahweh, Moses, and, and even, I think, at, at, at least one of those points, Joshua goes up with him. But then also, when God appears in the tent of meeting to not only Moses, but again, Joshua, the son of Nun, constantly in there with him, it's this face-to-face stuff, and at mm-hmm. the end of Deuteronomy, says that there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt and to Pharaoh and all his servants in his land. Uh, it's that kind of face to face you see even in the Old Testament. And that's what uh, was, was meant to be in many ways for all the people, though I don't, I don't think it was uh, quite possible for them at the level like right. Moses and, and, and Joshua, but they are to have that kind of relationship with Yahweh, and it's, you see that throughout the entire Bible, and it's, it's most fully revealed in the relationship we're to have with Christ. Right. Um, what Bob noted was, again, Moses seeing God, again, was a face-to-face encounter. And this is repeated, in fact, at the very end of the book, where it says there's not been a prophet yet like Moses who, God, who knew God face-to-face. And again, that's not going to happen. We're not going to have a person like Moses. Again, that's most likely a later editorial comment, looking back, reflecting on what Moses had written, reflecting back in his own day. So, you know, not David, not Joshua, not any of the judges was like Moses who knew God face to face. And yet, clearly, there seems to be a person who knows God like this. There seems to be a king coming and will come. And so again, that is who our hope is in, who, this coming king who came as Jesus Christ. Any other questions? Right, I just thank you all for your time today. Um, I know it was a little complicated than normal, but um, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, you're dismissed. <laughs>